Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by the Royal Tyrrell Museum, which is located in southern Alberta, Canada. It's one of the top paleontological research institutes in the world. The entire museum is dedicated to the science of paleontology. It's definitely a must-see for every dinosaur enthusiast. More information can be found at tyrrellmuseum.com. In this episode, we don't have an interview, but we do have Dinosaur of the Day Bars Boldia, a bunch of dinosaur news, and we want to give an especially big thank you to some of our $5 patrons. We're splitting them up because the group is getting really large, so we're just going to thank a few people in each episode now. So this episode, we'd like to thank Chris, Nicholas, and Kyle and Betsy. Thanks, guys. We really appreciate you. Yeah. And if you'd like to get a shout out, there are still some spots available in the limited $5 tier on patreon.com slash I know dino. And of course, there are other things available too. So jumping right into the news, did dinosaurs have feathers? Not all of them. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> We've talked about dinosaur feathers versus skin in other episodes and how certain dinosaurs we have found feathers, other dinosaurs we found a lot of skin impressions that kind of seem to indicate that they didn't have feathers. And... We've got two more dinosaur skin impressions that don't seem to show much for feathers. They were both uncovered by Spanish paleontologists near Barcelona in the southern Pyrenees, and the area was previously known for eggs and trackways as well as bones, which is pretty uncommon since the sediments that fossilize trackways usually don't do as well with bones, so finding both in the same area is pretty cool. The largest skin impression is about 10 inches or about 25 centimeters at its widest, and they are about 66 million years old, making them some of the youngest known dinosaur skin impressions, which makes sense since 66 million years ago is when the Cretaceous mass extinction happened. The shape and size of the scales match with the expected pattern of a sauropod, and since the only sauropods known to the locality and the era are titanosaurs, the researchers believe that the skin impression is from a titanosaur. And given this detail, they are some of the last trace fossils made by sauropods and titanosaurs. So the great preservation of these skin impressions means that the dinosaur was buried in mud almost immediately after it died. And the two impressions are only about five feet apart, so the impressions might both be from the same individual. I always like these trace fossils because they give you a little bit more of a eye into what the dinosaurs were like outside of just their bones. So it's neat to see the scales and they look a lot like what you'd imagine dragon scales or something to look at. They're pretty big. And in the paper, they mentioned that the scales are quite a bit bigger than you see on things like tyrannosaurs or other large predators. They tend to have smaller scales compared to these sauropods. So it's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. What's also cool is our next news story which is about how herbivorous dinosaurs may not have only eaten plants. This is according to The Atlantic. And it's based on some older studies, but the article just came out, and it's pretty interesting. So back in August, paleontologist Ji Tiang and colleagues found that Liaoningosaurus, a Chinese ankylosaur, had fish fossils in its stomach. So... Leoningosaurus was found in 2001 and is an odd ankylosaur. It was only about one foot long. Ji Tiang said that Leoningosaurus may have acted like a turtle and it was a small swimming carnivore. However, it's unclear how the fish fossils got into its stomach. It could have eaten them, or when it died, its body may have settled on top of the dead fish, or the fish sheltered and fed inside its body when it was buried. The fish are scattered in the body. They're not all concentrated in the gut. So G and his colleagues argue that the fish were digested and the dinosaur is a carnivore, but it's not completely clear if Leoningosaurus was aquatic. So Victoria Arbor, who Garrett interviewed in a previous episode, examined Leoningosaurus in 2010 and said that the plastron, which is, quote, a bony structure on the stomach common in aquatic reptiles like turtles, end quote, looked more like 
as she put it, quote, a weird chunk of skin that got preserved, <laughs> end quote. It also had unfused bones, which could mean it was a juvenile and not a marine reptile, since dinosaur bones often fuse as they get older. Also, since it's so small, it seems likely to have been a juvenile, though there are other known Leoningosaurus specimens, and they're all small, but these haven't been officially described in scientific journals yet. On the other hand, Leoningosaurus had sharp claws and teeth that seemed to fit it being a fish eater, so there's still questions about G and his team's hypothesis that Leoningosaurus was carnivorous. And if it's true, though, it's interesting to think about how other herbivorous dinosaurs may not have only eaten plants. And the article ends with saying, like, even modern herbivorous animals, such as deer, cattle, and horses, have eaten baby birds and dead fish, apparently. That's interesting. So it's kind of counter to what I would consider the definition of being herbivorous, but I guess maybe herbivory <laughs> isn't as tightly defined and constrained as most of us think. Yeah, or you just eat whatever's around. Yeah, as long as you can digest it. That's the thing that's a little interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Next, thanks to Jen who shared this one with us via Facebook. The Utah Raptor Project has a GoFundMe page and is looking to raise money to properly reveal the group of Utah Raptor bones from a nine-ton rock and prepare them and analyze them. The project's being spearheaded by employees and former employees of the Utah Geological Survey in Salt Lake City and the Museum of Ancient Life at Thanksgiving Point, Lehigh, Utah. We've talked about this before, and we interviewed paleontologist Jim Kirkland about the discovery back in episode 34. And so it's been going on for a while. Their goal is to raise $100,000 with an initial goal of $16,000 to buy equipment to prepare the fossils. So $25 will give you access to their blog, and then you can see and read about the process. And I think they said they were going to live stream some of the uncovering. So, so far they've raised about $1,700. We'll post a link so you can check it out and decide if you want to donate. Yeah, that's cool. I know that it's really hard to fundraise for these kinds of things, so it's an interesting idea to go to crowdfunding for it. Mm-hmm. Well, I know they've been trying to get this done for a while. It's a project years in the making, and then it's stalled for about a year because they've run out of funding. Yeah, and it's such a big piece to excavate. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of time and effort from a lot of people. Yeah, but we could learn a lot about Utah raptors. Mm-hmm. And they're pretty awesome, since they're basically what people think of as Velociraptor from Jurassic Park. Yep. <laughs> so next, thanks to Chris, who shared this one with us via Facebook. The Facebook page Amazing Geologist shared an image of a 98% complete dinosaur skeleton. According to the post, it's a young predatory theropod from southern Germany, about 135 million years old and 28 inches or 72 centimeters long, and it may be the most complete dinosaur found so far. Cool. Yeah, it's a cool picture. Next, Jean-Henrique Edelman, a husband and wife team who founded a financial planning firm, are donating $25 million to Rowan University to create a dinosaur museum, according to Philly.com. So Rowan University is their alma mater, and the goal is to build a museum, visitor center, laboratories, a nature trail, and a paleontology-themed playground at a former quarry that has a lot of dinosaur-era fossils. They're mostly marine animals, such as sharks and mosasaurs, but there's also some dinosaurs. What? Mosasaurs aren't dinosaurs? <laughs> no, you didn't know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's really awesome that they're doing this. That is cool. It's the dream. Yeah. It is. <laughs> Next, Rotoscopers wrote a detailed review of Disney's Dinosaur Movie, which I know it came out in 2000, but it's interesting to hear about the history of everything that led up to the making of Dinosaur. So according to the article, it was made by The Secret Lab, which was a CG studio and a combination of what was then recently acquired Dream Quest, an FX house, and WDFA's CG unit. The idea was to make the movie very kid-friendly to get kids interested and then sell more toys to kids. <laughs> and this goes against Walt Disney's vision of not talking down to his audiences, which every documentary I've seen about him, yeah, that makes sense. He was all about 
pushing the envelope and doing the most innovative thing and telling stories in groundbreaking ways. And hmm. it was meant to be all ages, I guess, more for adults. Yeah. Yeah. Disney movies and Pixar movies kind of have that aspect to them where you can watch them as an older person and enjoy them. Whereas like those Saturday morning cartoons or whatever that adults tend to hate, but their kids like yeah. a lot of times. So originally the movie Dinosaur wasn't supposed to have dialogue, just like how Land Before Time was originally planned, although I'm glad they did end up having dialogue in that one. But then the head of Disney at the time, Michael Eisner, made dialogue a requirement for the film. The writer of this review said that they found the dialogue flat and similar to one-liners in sitcoms without having good character arcs or a strong plot. <laughs> That's pretty accurate. It does, all the dialogue is pretty weak in that movie. Yeah. So the problem they're saying is that the movie's trying to please everyone, yet it's a little bit too intense for young kids and it's too dumbed down for older kids and adults. But it does have a strong opening sequence and it shows the dinosaurs without any dialogue. And what's interesting is when I first saw that movie, I thought, hey, this is like a CG version of Land Before Time. Yeah, it's got a lot of things in common. Yeah, the storyline was fairly similar. I think it would have been a lot better without dialogue. The opening scene is the best part of the movie. Yeah, I agree. So moving on, according to DC Comics, Superman had a special two-issue arc where Clark Kent and his son John accidentally end up on Dinosaur Island. The issues are in honor of the late Darwin Cook and Superman and his son. They create a drone for a science fair experiment for John. But the drone assimilates with some of the crystals at their Fortress of Solitude, which is how they are transported to Dinosaur Island. The island has military graves and the skeleton of a fallen soldier as well, so there's a bit of mystery as to why there's a military presence on this mysterious Dinosaur Island, which to me kind of sounds like is their own version of Jurassic Park. But Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty similar, mm -hmm. suspiciously similar, some might say. I guess we have to read the comic to see the differences. Although after reading Articulating Dinosaurs, the whole theme of dinosaurs being on an island and being conquered by people is super common, even before Jurassic Park, so shouldn't be too surprised that that's the route they went. That's true. There are a lot of other movies that have that. Yeah, and books. Mm-hmm. But cool that they did that. So last in the news, according to Inverse, some of the aliens on Star Trek were inspired by and... They also, according to the storyline, they were descended from dinosaurs. Hmm. Michael Westmore, a makeup artist on Star Trek, did a Q&A and said he was inspired by snakes and turtles and dinosaurs when creating the aliens. So he said he used the dinosaur vertebrae shown in a book about dinosaurs. He didn't say which book, but it, he used that as the basis for the foreheads of Jem Hadar and many of the Klingons. That's really funny. Yeah. And looking at the pictures, it's like, oh, yeah, I totally see that. Now. Yeah. Yeah, like the chevrons and stuff mm -hmm. sticking out on the sides and everything. That's interesting. In a real quick aside, there's a new TV show called Westworld that was based on a screenplay that Michael Crichton wrote, and it's super good. So if you want some Michael Crichton action, you should watch it. There aren't any dinosaurs, but it's good. Not to be confused with the TV show they're making next year based on Michael Crichton's book, which is what I thought Garrett was going to go with at <laughs> oh, first. <yeah. laughs> a different Michael Crichton, but actual dinosaurs themed show. That's the one for next year, not yeah. Westworld. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into the dinosaur of the day, we have another word from the Royal Tyrrell Museum. The Royal Tyrrell Museum is one of the largest and most respected paleontology museums in the world. The museum takes you on a journey through time that brings you face to face with some of Canada's mightiest dinosaurs. With nine ever-evolving galleries, fun hands-on activities, and the rugged beauty of Alberta's badlands that yield the greatest diversity of dinosaur fossils in the world, there's something for everyone. Perusing through some of their public programs on their website, I just ran into the fossil casting program, and they describe it as for ages four and up, but children... <laughs> we're included mm -hmm. what do you know children under 12 have to be accompanied by a participating paid adult companion so that could also be us <laughs> maybe and 
If you're under three, unfortunately, you're not allowed in because of health and safety reasons. And as a warning, they use latex molds, but otherwise, you're good to go. It's a really cool looking hands-on activity where you get to make your own fossil replica and you get to learn about the differences between fossils and casts in a very hands-on way. And then you also find out why casts are important in the museum, which I'm assuming is mostly so that they don't have to display the real fossils and they can keep those in a vault and use them for studying. As well as we've talked about how you rarely get a fully articulated dinosaur so you have to fill in the pieces and you can use casts from similar dinosaurs to do that. So, so Or 3D printed now. Yeah, 3D printed would be cool too. I don't know if they have a public program for that yet. That's the way a lot of this stuff is headed. Once you make the cast, you get to keep it. And there are instructions on different ways you can paint it to make it look as realistic as possible and how to texture it. And then they even say that you can use glue and sand around it to give it the impression that it was encased in sandstone and that it's sort of slightly protruding out of the rock, which would be kind of fun to do. That sounds like the best souvenir ever. Yeah, <laughs> it is pretty cool. So if you're interested in that, you can find it on their website, tyrolmuseum.com. And if you're looking to support paleontological research, you can join the museum's membership program, which supports its scientific research exhibits and education programs and offers unlimited admission to the museum. More information can be found at tyrolmuseum.com, and that's T-Y-R-R-E-L-L museum.com. And now for our dinosaur of the day, Barsbolia, which was a request from Brecht via Facebook, so thank you. The type species is Barsbolia sisinski. It's a large hadrosaurid dinosaur that lived in the Cretaceous and was found in Mongolia in the Nemect Formation. The name means of Barsbold, and Barsboldia was named after a famous Mongolian paleontologist, Dr. Rinchen Barsbold. Teresa Marianska and Haska Osmolska Named Barsboldia in 1981 based on a partial skeleton with nine back vertebrae, nine hip vertebrae, 15 tail vertebrae, a partial pelvis, and some ribs. Marianska and Osmolska said Barsboldia was a lambiosaurine, a hollow crested hadrosaur, which was the first from the Nemect formation, though they didn't find a skull. But it does have lambiosaurine features, such as a sacrum with a keel along the bottom and bones that look similar to Hippocrosaurus. However, since there's only a partial skeleton and no skull, some scientists consider it a dubious genus, and a 2011 study suggested it was actually a sorolophene. The study was by Albert Prieto Marquez, called A Reappraisal of Barsboldia Sisinski Dinosauria Hadrosauridae from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia, and it was published in the Journal of Paleontology. It makes sense if it's a Sorolophene instead, because by the time that Barsboldia lived, sorolophenes had mostly replaced lambiosaurines. So if it was a sorolophene, Barsboldia would have had a small, solid bone crest, or maybe even no bone crest on its head. Though some studies of Edmontosaurus, a relative, have found that some sorolophenes did have soft tissue crests. They're very rarely preserved, though. Hmm. Barsboldia had tall neural spines, especially the ones over the hips. The tips in the first few tail vertebrae were club-shaped, possibly because of old age. And our listener, Brett, who requested this dinosaur, said that he has a hypothesis about Barsboldia, so I'll just read it to you. Quote, it had large spines, just like Acrocanthosaurus. Maybe inside this tall spines there were fat reserves saved to survive the deserts of Mongolia, just like camels today, end quote. And it could be. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit with Spinosaurus, the idea that maybe it was like a big hump mm -hmm. that was used that way. Yeah, and then kind of look at Spinosaurus a bit differently. but <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Since Barsboldia is a hadrosaur, it was both bipedal and quadrupedal, and it would have eaten plants with lots of continually replaced teeth. It's not clear, though, how large it was. Other dinosaurs that lived at the same time and place included Sorolophus, a hadrosaur, Tarkia, an ankylosaur, Nemetosaurus, a titanosaur, and predators such as Allioramus and Tarbosaurus, which were tyrannosaurs. 
There's two subfamilies of hadrosaurids. There's lambiosaurines, who have the hollow crests, and sauropods with solid crests. Pre-2010, most hadrosaurines were classified as sauropods, and we talk about that more in episode 31, Corythosaurus. Before, the group was known as hadrosaurinae, hadrosaurs that, for the most part, didn't have crests, but then the genus Hadrosaurus was found to be more primitive, so the subfamily was renamed Sauropodinae. Very cool. Hadrosaurs, also known as the cows of the Cretaceous, yep. are <laughs> rarely talked about, even though they're so abundant, and a lot of them are really cool. And probably pretty important to their ecosystem. Oh, for sure. I really liked the description that Scott Persons gave about some of the hadrosaurs, and you kind of wonder, like, how did these exist, and what niche were they in? Because they were too slow to outrun things, and they weren't big enough to kind of fend them off, and they didn't have a lot of weaponry, so they're a very interesting group. But they might have herded or something, or been just fast enough to kind of outpace them in long distance. Yeah, there's power in numbers. Yep. And our fun fact of the day is that Nyasasaurus, at 243 million years old, is sometimes considered to be the earliest known dinosaur. Unfortunately, it is a little complicated looking at specimens from that time frame, since you're drawing a line in random evolutions between dinosaurs and dinosaur morphs, which is the larger group of all animals resembling dinosaurs that also includes dinosaurs. So Nyasasaurus has some characteristics that are typical of dinosaurs, but quite a few that aren't seen in any other dinosaurs, so it's kind of in a gray area. The paper, The Precise Temporal Calibration of Dinosaur Origins, by Claudia Marsicano and others, estimates the origin of dinosaurs in the Carnian period, which is the period about 228 to 235 million years ago, or roughly 10 million years younger than Nyasasaurus. This is based on an analysis of a basin in northwest Argentina, which luckily has the, quote, earliest dinosaur fossils of all three major clads, Ornithischia, Sauropodomorpha, and Theropoda, end quote. So that's pretty remarkable that it has all of those things in the same place, and it might also point to the potential location where they started out, although back then we had Pangaea going on, so maybe it's not as good of a guess, but in any event, depending on how selective you want to be, the earliest known dinosaur could also be Herrerasaurus, Eoraptor, Saturnalia, which I hadn't heard of before, but that's pretty awesome. It's named after the same festival in ancient Rome. Al Walkeri, Storicosaurus, or others which are all approximately 220 to 230 million years old and about 10 million years younger than Nyasasaurus. It's also important to note that we almost certainly will never find the earliest dinosaur, since that would be a specific individual and the fossil record is not nearly complete enough to get that kind of resolution. And you see this when we're looking at even just human evolution, which was obviously much more recent, and we're constantly filling in these little tiny gaps. And you can always point to a gap and say, hey, what? when did this group split off from this other group? And there's always these little gaps that you can't fill in all of them. So That's too bad. Yeah, but it's really fun because that means that there's always a chance that you'll find another one that'll give you a little bit more information. So... Hopefully we find some earlier ones and get a little bit more of the full picture of how dinosaurs evolved from other dinosaur morphs back in the Triassic. Yeah, that'd be good. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And if you want to join our growing number of supporters, please check out our page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.